Chapter 11 British Kafraria It is not improbable that many Englishmen who have not been altogether inattentive to the course of public affairs as affecting Great Britain may be unaware that we once possessed in South Africa a separate colony called British Kafraria, with a governor of its own, and a form of government altogether distinct from that of its big brother the Cape colony. Such however is the fact, though the territory did not, perhaps, attract much notice at the time of its annexation. Some years after the last Kafir War which may have the year 1850 given to it as its date, and after that wonderful Kafir famine which took place in 1857 the famine which the natives created for themselves by destroying their own cattle and their own food dash British Kafraria was made a separate colony and was placed under the rule of Colonel Maclean. The sanction from England for the arrangement had been long given, but it was not carried out till 1860 it was not intended that the country should be taken away from the Kafirs, dash but only the rule over the country, and the privilege of living in accordance with their own customs. Nor was this privilege abrogated. All at once, or abruptly, gradually and piecemeal they were to be introduced to what we call civilization. Gradually and piecemeal the work is still going on dash and so progressing that there can hardly be a doubt that as far as their material condition is concerned we have done well with the Kafirs. The Kafir chiefs may feel dash certainly do. Feel dash that they have been aggrieved. They have been as it were knocked. About, deprived of their power, humiliated and degraded, and, as far as British Kafraria is concerned, made almost ridiculous in the eyes of their own people. But the people themselves have been relieved from the force of a grinding tyranny. They increase and multiply because they are no longer driven to fight and be slaughtered in the wars which the chiefs were continually waging for supremacy among each other. What property they acquire they can hold without fear of losing it by arbitrary force. They are no longer subject to the terrible superstitions which their chiefs have used for keeping them in subjection. Their huts are better and their food more constantly. Sufficient. Many of them work for wages. They are partially. Clothed dash sometimes with such grotesque partiality as quite to justify. The comical stories which we have heard at home as to Kafir full dress. But the habit of wearing clothes is increasing among them. In the towns. They are about as well clad as the ordinary Irish beggar dash and as the. Traveller recedes from the towns he perceives that this raiment gradually gives way to blankets and red clay. But to have got so far as the Irish beggar condition in twenty years is very much, and the custom is certainly spreading itself. The Kafir who has assiduously worn breeches for a year does feel, not a moral but a social shame, at going without them. As I have no doubt whatever that the condition of these people has been improved by our coming, and that British rule has been on the whole beneficent to them, I cannot but approve of the annexation of British Kafraria. But I doubt whether when it was done the justification was as complete as in those former days, twenty years before, when Lord Glenelg reprimanded Sir Benjamin D. Urban for the extension he made in the same territory, and drew back the borders of British sovereignty, and restored their lands and their prestige and their customs to the natives, and declared himself willing to be responsible for all results that might follow dash results which at last cost so much British blood and so much British money. The difficult question meets one at every corner in South Africa. What is the duty of the white man in reference to the original inhabitant? The Kafir chief will say that it is the white man's duty to stay away and not to touch what does not belong to him. The Dutch colonist will say that it is the white man's duty to make the best he can of the good things God has provided for his use dash and that as the Kafir in his natural state is a bad thing he should either be got rid of, 
or made a slave. In either assertion there is an intelligible purpose capable of a logical argument. But the Briton has to go between the two, wavering much between the extremes of philanthropy and expansive energy. He knows that he has to get possession of the land and use it, and is determined that he will do so, dash but he knows also that it is wrong to take what does not belong to him and wrong also to treat another human being with harshness. And therefore with one hand he waves his humanitarian principles over Exeter Hall while with the other he annexes province. After province. As I am myself a Briton I am not a fair critic of the proceeding, dash but it does seem to me that he is upon the whole beneficent, though occasionally very unjust. After the wars, when this Kaffraria had become British, a body of German emigrants were induced to come here who have thriven wonderfully upon the land dash as Germans generally do. The German colonist is a humble heart. Working parsimonious man, who is content as long as he can eat and drink. In security and put by a modicum of money. He cares but little for the form of government to which he is subjected, but is very anxious as to a market for his produce. He is unwilling to pay any wages, but is always ready to work himself and to make his children work. He lives at first in some small hovel which he constructs for himself, and will content himself with maize instead of meat till he has put by money enough for the building of a neat cottage. And so he progresses till he becomes known in the neighborhood as a man who has money at the bank. Nothing probably has done more to make Kaffraria prosperous than this emigration of Germans. But British Kaffraria did not exist long as a separate possession of the Crown, having been annexed to the Cape Colony in 1864. From that time it has formed part of the eastern province. It has three thriving English towns, King Williamstown, the capital, East London the port, and Queenstown, further up the country than King Williamstown, dash towns which are peculiarly English though the country around is either cultivated by German farmers or held by Kaffir tenants. The district is still called British Kaffraria. I myself have some very dim remembrance of British Kaffraria as a colony, but like other places in the British Empire it has been absorbed by degrees without much notice at home. Starting from Grahamstown on a hired Cape Cart I entered British Kaffraria somewhere between that town and Fort Beaufort. A Cape Cart is essentially a South African vehicle, and is admirably adapted for the somewhat rough roads of the country. Its great merit is that it travels on only two wheels, dash but then so does our English gig. But the English gig carries only two passengers while the Cape Cart has room for four dash or even six. The Irish car no doubt has both these. Merits dash carries four and runs on two wheels, but the wheels are necessarily so low that they are ill-adapted for passing serious obstructions. And the Cape cart can be used with two horses, or four as the need may be. A one-horse vehicle is a thing hardly spoken of in South Africa, and would meet with more scorn than it does even in the States. But the chief peculiarity of the Cape Cart is the yoke of the horses, which is somewhat similar in its nature to that of the Kekel, which used to be very dangerous and very fashionable in the days of George IV. With us a pair of horses is now always connected with four wheels, and with the idea of security which four wheels give. Though the horse may tumble down the vehicle stands, it was not so with the Kekel. When a horse fell, he would generally bring down his comrade horse with him, and then the vehicle would go dash to the almost certain destruction of the pole and the imminent danger of the passengers. But, with the cape cart the bar, instead of passing over the horses, back the bar on which the vehicle must rest when for a moment it loses 
its balance on the two wheels with a propulsion forwards passes under the horse's necks, with straps appended to the collars. I have never seen a horse fall with one of them, dash but I can understand that when such an accident happens the falling horse should not bring the other animal down with him. The advantage of having two high wheels dash and only two dash need not be explained to any traveler. On the way to Fort Beaufort I passed by Fort Brown dash a desolate barrack, which was heretofore employed for the protection of the frontier when Graham's town was the frontier city. I arrived there by a fine pass, excellently well engineered, through the mountains, called the Queen's Road dash very picturesque from the shape of the hills, though desolate, from the absence of trees. But at Fort Brown the beauty was gone and nothing but the desolation remained. The fort stands just off the road, on a plain, and would hold perhaps forty or fifty men. I walked up to it and found one lonely woman who told me that she was the wife of a policeman, stationed at some distant place. It had become the fate of her life to live here in solitude, and a more lonely creature I never saw. She was clean and pleasant and talked well, dash but she declared that unless she was soon liberated from Fort Brown she must go mad. She was eloquent in favor of hard work declaring that there was nothing else which could give a real charm to life, dash but perhaps she had been roused to that feeling by knowing that there was not a job to be done upon the earth to which in her present circumstances she could turn her hand. Optat Arare. Cabalas. She told me of a son who was employed in one of the distant provinces, and bade me find him if I could and tell him of his mother. Tell him to think of me here all alone, she said. I tried to execute my commission but failed to find the man. I had intended sleeping at Fort Beaufort and on going from thence up the Catsburg Mountain. But I was prevented by the coming of a gentleman, a Wesleyan minister, who was very anxious that I should see the Kaffir school at Heald Town over which he presided. From first to last through. My tour I was subject to the privileges and inconveniences of being known as a man who was going to write a book. I never said as much to anyone in South Africa dash or even admitted it when interrogated. I could not deny that I possibly might do so, but I always protested that my examiner had no right to assume the fact. All this, however, was quite Vain as coming from one who had written so much about other colonies, and was known to be so inveterate a scribbler as myself. Then the argument, though never expressed in plain words, would take, in suggested ideas, the following form. Here you are in South Africa, and you are going to write about us. If so I dash or we, or my ORR institution, have an absolute claim to a certain portion of your attention. You have no right to pass our town by, and then to talk of the next town merely because such an arrangement will suit your individual comfort. Then I would allege the shortness of my time. Time. Indeed. Then take more time. Here am I dash or here are we, doing our very best and we don't intend to be passed by because you don't allow yourself enough of time for your work. When all this was said on behalf of some very big store, or perhaps in favor of a pretty view, or as has been the case dash in pride at the possession of a little cabbage garden, I have been apt to wax wroth and to swear that I was my own master, dash but a Kaffir missionary school, to which some earnest Christian man, with probably an earnest Christian wife, devotes a life in the hope of making fresh water flow through the dry wilderness, has claims. However painful they may be at the moment, this gentleman had come into Fort Beaufort on purpose to catch me. And as he was very eloquent, and as I did feel a certain duty, I allowed myself to be led away by him. I fear that I went ungraciously, and I know that I went unwillingly. It 
was just four o'clock and, having had no luncheon, I wanted my dinner. I had already established myself in a very neat little sitting room in the inn, and had taken off my boots. I was tired and dusty, and was about to wash myself. I had been on the road all day, and the bedroom offered to me look sweet and clean, dash and there was a pretty young lady at the inn, who had given me a cup of tea to support me till dinner should be ready. I was anxious also about the Catsburg Mountain, which under the minister's guidance I should lose, at any rate for the present. I spoke to the minister of my dinner, dash but he assured me that an hour would take me out to his place at Heald Town. He clearly thought dash and clearly said dash that it was my duty to go, and I acceded. He promised to convey me to the establishment in an hour dash but it was two hours and a half before we were there. He allured me by speaking of the beauty of the road dash but it was pitch dark all the way. It was eight o'clock before my wants were supplied, and by that time I hated Kaffir children thoroughly. Of Heald Town and Lovedale dash a much larger Kaffir school dash I will speak in the next chapter, which shall be exclusively educational. Near to Lovedale is the little town of Alice in which I stayed two days with the hospitable doctor. He took me out for a day's hunting as it is called, which in that benighted country means shooting. I must own here to have made a little blunder. When I was asked some days previously whether I would like to have a day's hunting got up for me in the neighborhood of Alice, I answered with alacrity in the affirmative. Hunting, which is the easiest of all sports, has ever been an allurement to me. To hunt. As we hunt at home, it is only necessary that a man should stick on to the back of a horse dash or, failing that, that he should fall off. When Hunting was offered to me I thought that I could at any rate go out and see. But on my arrival at Alice I found that hunting meant shooting, an exercise of skill in which I had never even tried to prevail. I haven't fired off a gun, I said, for forty years. But I had agreed to go out hunting, and word had passed about the country, and a hundred naked Kaffirs were to be congregated to drive the game. I tried hard to escape. Might I not be allowed to go and see the naked Kaffirs, without a gun dash especially as it was so probable that I might shoot one of them if I were armed. But this would not do. I was told that the Kaffirs would despise me. So I took the gun and carried it ever so many miles, on horseback, to my very great annoyance. At a certain spot on a hillside dash where the hill downwards was covered. With bush and shrubs, we met the naked Kaffirs. There were a hundred of them, I was told, more or less, and they were as naked as my heart could. Desire dash but each carrying some fragment of a blanket wound round on his arm, and many of them were decorated with bracelets and earrings. There were some preliminary ceremonies such as the lying down of a young Kaffir and the pretense of all the men around him dash and of all the dogs, of which there was a large muster dash that the prostrate figure was a dead buck over whom it was necessary to lick their lips and shake their weapons, dash and after this the Kaffirs went down into the bush. Then I was led away by my white friend, carrying my gun and leading my horse, and after a while was told that the very spot had been found. If I would remain there with my gun cocked and ready, a buck would surely come by. Almost at once so that I might shoot him. I did as I was bid, and sat. Alert for thirty minutes holding my gun as though something to be shot. Would surely come every second. But nothing came and I gradually went to sleep. Then of a sudden I heard the Kaffirs approaching. They had beaten the woods for a mile along the valley, and then a gun was fired and then another, and gradually my white friends reappeared among the Kaffirs. One had shot a bird, and another a hare, and the most triumphant of the 
Number had slaughtered a very fat monkey of a peculiarly blue color. About his hinder quarters. This was the great Batu of the day. There were two or three other resting places at which I was instructed to stand and wait, and then we would be separated again, and again after a while would come the noise of the Kafirs. But no one shot anything. Further, and during the whole day nothing appeared before my eyes at which I was even able to aim my gun. But the native Kafirs with their red paint and their blankets wound round their arms, passing here and there through the bush and beating for game, were real enough and very interesting. I was told that to them it was a day of absolute delight, and that they were quite satisfied with having been allowed to be there. I have spoken before of the Kafir scare of 1876 during which it was certainly the general opinion at Graham's town that there was about to be a general rising among the natives, and that it would behove all. Europeans in the eastern province to look well to their wives and children and homesteads. I have described the manner in which my friend at the ostrich farm fortified his place with turrets, and I had heard of some settlers further east who had left their homes in the conviction that they were no longer safe. Gentlemen at Graham's town had assured me that the danger had been as though men were going about a powder magazine with lighted candles. Here, where was our hunting party, we were in the center of the Kaffirs. A farmer who was with us owned the land down to the Kumi River which was at our feet, and on the other side there was a wide district which had been left by government to the Kaffirs when we annexed the land dash a district in which the Kaffirs live. After their old fashion, this man had his wife and children within a mile or two of hordes of untamed savages. When I asked him about the scare of last year, he laughed at it. Some among his neighbors had fled, dash and had sold their cattle for what they would fetch. But he, when he saw that Kaffirs were buying the cattle thus sold, was very sure that they would not buy that which they could take without price if war should come. But the Kaffirs around him, he said, had no idea of war. And, when they heard of all that the Europeans were doing, they had thought that some attack was to be made on them. 13 The Kaffirs as a body no doubt hate their invaders, but they would be well content to be allowed to hold what they still possess without further struggles with the white man, if they were sure of being undisturbed in their holdings. But they will be disturbed. Gradually, for this and the other reason. From causes which the white man of the day will be sure to be able to justify at any rate to himself, more and more will be annexed, till there will not be a hillside which the Kafir can call his own dominion. As a tenant he will be admitted, and as a farmer, if he will farm the land, he will be welcomed. But the Kafir hillsides with the Kafir crawls dash or homesteads dash and the Kafir flocks will all gradually be annexed and made subject to British taxation. From Alice I went on to King William's town dash at first through a cold but grandly mountainous country, but coming, when halfway, to a spot smiling with agriculture, called Deb Neck, where too there were forest trees and green slopes. At Deb Neck I met a young farmer who was full of the hardships to which he was subjected by the unjust courses taken by the government. I could not understand his grievance, but he seemed to me to have a very pleasant spot of ground on which to sow his seed and reap his corn. His mother kept an hotel, and was racy with a fine Irish brogue which many years in the colony had failed in the least to tarnish. She had come from Armagh and was delighted to talk of the beauty and bounty and great glory of the old primate, Beresford. She sighed for her native land and shook her head incredulously when I reminded her of the insufficiency of potatoes for the needs of man or woman. I never met an Irishman out of his own country, who, from some perversity of memory, did not think that he had always been accustomed to eat meat three times a day, 
and wear broadcloth when he was at home. King William's town was the capital of British Kafraria, and is now the seat of a British regiment. I am afraid that at this moment it is the headquarters of much more than one. This perhaps will be the best place in which to say a few words on the question of keeping British troops in the Cape Colony. It is held to be good colonial doctrine that a colony which governs itself, which levies and uses its own taxes, and which does in pretty nearly all things as seems good to itself in its own sight, should pay its own bills, dash and among other bills any bill that may be necessary for its own defence. Australia has no British soldiers dash not an English red coat, nor has Canada, though Canada before so many miles flanked by a country desirous of annexing it. My readers will remember too that even while the Maoris were still in arms the last regiment was withdrawn from New Zealand dash so greatly to the disgust of New Zealand politicians that the New Zealand minister of the day flew out almost in mutiny against our Secretary of State at the time. But the principle was maintained, and the measure was carried, and the last Regiment was withdrawn. But at that time ministerial responsibility and parliamentary government had not as yet been established in the Cape Colony, and there were excuses for British soldiers at the Cape which no longer existed in New Zealand. Now parliamentary government and ministerial responsibility are as strong at Cape Town as at Wellington, but the British troops still remain in the Cape Colony. There will be I think, when this book is published, more than three regiments in the colony or employed in its defence. The parliamentary system began only in 1872, and it may be alleged that the withdrawal of troops should be gradual. It may be alleged also that the present moment is peculiar, and that the troops are all this time specially needed. It should, however, be remembered that when the troops were finally withdrawn from New Zealand, disturbance among the Maoris was still rampant there. I suppose there can hardly be a doubt that it is a subject on which a so-called conservative Secretary of State may differ slightly from a so-called liberal minister. Had Lord Kimberley remained in office there might possibly be fewer soldiers in the Cape Colony. But the principle remains and has I think so established itself, that probably no colonial secretary of whatever party would now deny its intrinsic justice. Then comes the question whether the Cape Colony should be made an exception, and if so why? I am inclined to think that no visitor, travelling in the country with his eyes open, and with capacity for seeing the things around him, would venture to say that the soldiers should be withdrawn now, at this time, looking back at the nature of the Kafir Wars, looking round at the state of the Kafir people, knowing as he would know that they are armed not only with assegais but with guns, and remembering the possibilities of Kafir warfare, he would hesitate to leave a quarter of a million of white people to defend themselves against a million and a half of warlike hostile natives. The very Withdrawal of the troops might itself too probably cause a prolonged cessation of that peace to which the Kafir chiefs have till lately felt themselves constrained by the presence of the red coats, and for the speedy re-establishment of which the continued presence of the red coats is thought to be necessary. The capable and clear-sighted stranger of whom I am speaking would probably decline to take such responsibility upon himself even though he were as strong in the theory of colonial self-defence as was Lord Granville when he took the soldiers away from New Zealand. But it does not follow that on that account he should think that the Cape Colony should be an exception to a rule which as to other colonies has been found to be sound. It may be wise to keep the soldiers in the colony, but have been unwise to saddle the colony with full parliamentary institutions before it was able to bear their weight. If the soldiers be necessary, then the place was not ripe for parliamentary institutions. 
that may be a very possible opinion as to the affairs of South Africa generally. I am again driven to assert the difference between South Africa and Canada or Australia or New Zealand. South Africa is a land peopled with colored inhabitants. Those other places are lands peopled with white men. I will not again vex my reader with numbers dash not now at least. He will perhaps remember the numbers, and bethink himself of what has to be done before all those Negroes can be assimilated and digested, and made into efficient parliamentary voters, who shall have civilization, and the good of their country, and God save the Queen. Generally, at their heart's core, a mistake has perhaps been made, dash but. I do not think that because of that mistake the troops should be withdrawn from the colony. I cannot, however, understand why they should be kept at Cape Town, to the safety of which they are no more necessary than they would be to that of Sydney or Melbourne. It is alleged that they can be moved more easily from Cape Town, than they might be from any inland depot. But we know that if wanted at all they will be wanted on the frontier dash say within 50 miles of the K River which is the present boundary of the colony. If the Kaffirs east of the K can be kept quiet, there will be no rising of those to the west of the river. It was the knowledge that there were troops at King Williamstown, not that there were troops at Cape Town, which operated so long on the mines of Creeley and other Transkian Kaffirs. And now that disturbance has come all the troops are sent to the frontier. If this be so, it would seem that British Kaffraria is the place in which they should be located. But Cape Town has been head quarters since the colony was a colony, and headquarters are never moved very easily. It is right that I should add that the colony pays £10,000 a year to the mother country in aid of the cost of the troops. I need hardly say that that sum does not go far towards covering the total expense of two or more regiments on foreign service. Another difficulty is apt to arise dash which I fear will now be found to be a difficulty in South Africa. If imperial troops be used in a colony, which enjoys parliamentary government, who is to be responsible for their employment? The parliamentary minister will expect that they shall be used as he may direct, dash but so will not the authorities at home. In this way there can hardly fail to be difference of opinion between the governor of the colony and his responsible advisers. King Williamstown is a thoroughly commercial little city with a pleasant club, with a railway to East London, and with smiling German cultivation all around it. But it has no trees. There is indeed a public garden in which the military band plays with great eclat, and in which horses can be ridden, and carriages with ladies be driven about dash so as to look almost like Hyde Park in June. I stayed three or four days at the place and was made very comfortable, but what struck me most was the excellence of the Kaffir servant who waited upon me. A gentleman had kindly let me have the use of his house, and with his house the services of this treasure. The man was so gentle, so punctual, and so mindful of all things that I could not but think what an acquisition he would be to any fretful old gentleman in London. When I was at King Williamstown I was invited to hold a conference with two or three Kaffir chiefs, especially with Sandili, whose son I had seen at school, and who was the heir to Geka, one of the great kings of the Kaffirs, being the son of Geka's great wife, and brother to Makomo, the Kaffir who in the last war had done more than Kaffir had ever done before to break the British power in South Africa. It was Makomo who had been Sir Harry Smith's too powerful enemy Dash and Sandili, who is still living in the neighborhood of King Williamstown, was Makomo's younger but more royal brother. I expressed, of course, great satisfaction at the promised interview, but was warned that Sandili might not improbably be too drunk to come. 
On the morning appointed about twenty kafirs came to me, clustering round the door of the house in which I was lodging dash but they declined to enter. I therefore held my levy out in the street. Sandili was not there. The reason for his absence remained undivulged, but I was told that he had sent a troop of cousins in his place. The spokesman on the occasion was a chief named Sawani, who wore an old black coat, a flannel shirt, a pair of tweed trousers and a billycock hat dash comfortably and warmly dressed dash with a watch key of ordinary appearance ingeniously inserted into his ear as an ornament. An interpreter was provided, and out in the street, I carried on my colloquy with the dusky princes. Not one of them spoke but Sawani, and he expressed utter dissatisfaction with everything around him. The Kafirs, he said, would be much better off if the English would go away and leave them to their own customs. As for himself, though he had sent a great many of his clansmen to work on the railway dash where they got as he admitted good wages dash he had never himself received the allowance per head promised him. Why not appeal to the magistrate? I asked. He had done so frequently, he said, but the magistrate always put him off, and then, personally, he was treated with very insufficient respect. This complaint was repeated again and again. I, of course, insisted on the comforts which the Europeans had brought to the Kafirs dash trousers for instance dash and I remarked that all the royal princes around me were excellently well clad. The raiment was no doubt of the Irish beggar kind but still admitted of being described as excellent when compared in the mind with red clay and a blanket. Yes dash by compulsion, he said. We were told that we must come in and see you, and therefore we put on our trousers. Very uncomfortable they are, and we wish that you and the trousers and the magistrates, but above all the prisons, would go away out of the country together. He was very angry about the prisons, alleging that if the Kafirs did wrong, the Kafir chiefs would know how to punish them. None of his own children had ever gone to school dash nor did he approve of schools. In fact he was an unmitigated old savage, on whom my words of wisdom had no effect. Whatever, and who seemed to enjoy the opportunity of unburdening his resentment before a British traveller. It is probable that someone had given him to understand that I might possibly write a book when I returned home. When, after some half hour of conversation, he declared that he did not want to answer any more questions, I was not sorry to shake hands with the prominent half dozen, so as to bring the meeting to a close. But suddenly there came a grin across Sawani's face dash the first look of good humor which I had seen dash and the interpreter informed me that the chief wanted a little tobacco. I went back into my friend's house and emptied his tobacco pot, but this, though accepted, did not seem to give satisfaction. I whispered to the interpreter a question, and on being told that Sawani would not be too proud to buy his own tobacco, I gave the old beggar half a crown. Then he blessed me, as an Irish beggar might have done, grinned again and went off with his followers. They Kaffir boy or girl at school and the Kaffir man at work are pleasing objects, but the old Kaffir chief in quest of tobacco dash or brandy dash is not delightful. King Williamstown is the headquarters of the Cape Mounted Frontier Police, of which Mr. Boker, whose opinion respecting Kaffirdom I have already quoted, was at the period of my visit the Commandant. This is a force, consisting now of about 1,200 men, maintained by the colony itself for its own defense, and was no doubt established by the colony with a view of putting its own foot forward in its own behalf and doing something towards the achievement of that colonial independence of which I have spoken. It has probably been thought that the frontier police 
might at last stand in lieu of British soldiers. The effort has been well made, and the service is of great use. The brunt of the fighting in the late disturbance has been borne by the mounted police. The men are stationed about the country in small parties dash never I think more than 30 or 40 together, and often in smaller numbers. They are very much more efficacious than soldiers, as every man is mounted dash and they men themselves come from a much higher class than that from which our soldiers are enlisted. But the troop is expensive, each private costing on an average about sevens a day. The men are paid fives, sixty a day as soon as they are mounted dash out of which they have to buy and keep their horses and furnish everything for themselves. When they join the force there, horses and equipments are supplied to them, but the price is stopped out of their pay. They are recruited generally, though by no means universally, in England, under the care of an emigration agent who is maintained at home. I came out myself with six or seven of them dash three, of whom I knew to be sons of gentlemen, and all of whom may have been. So, so terrible is the struggle at home to find employment for young men, that the idea of one hundred pounds a year at once has charms, even though the receiver of it will have to keep not only himself, but a horse also, out of the money. But the prospect, if fairly seen, is not alluring. They, young men when in the colony are policemen and nothing more than policemen. Many of them after a short compulsory service find a better employment elsewhere, and their places are filled up by newcomers. From King William's town I went to East London by railway and there waited. Till the ship came which was to take me on to Natal. East London is another of those ports which stubborn nature seems to have made unfit for shipping, but which energy and enterprise are determined to convert to good purposes. As Graham's town believes in Port Alfred, so does King. William's town believe in East London, feeling sure that the day will come when no other harbour along the coast will venture to name itself in comparison with her. And East London has as firm a belief in herself, with a trustworthy reliance on a future day when the commerce of nations will ride in safety within her at present ill-omened bar. I had heard much of East London and had been warned that I might find it impossible to get on board the steamer even when she was lying in the roads. At Port Elizabeth it had been suggested to me that I might very probably have to come back there because no boat at East London would venture to take me out. The same thing was repeated to me along my route, and even at King William's town. But not the less on that account, when I found myself in British Coffraria of which East London is the port, was I assured of all that East London would hereafter perform. No doubt there was a perilous bar. The existence of the bar was freely admitted. No doubt the sweep of the sea in upon the mouth of the Buffalo River was of such a nature as to make all intercourse between ships and the shore both difficult and disagreeable. No doubt the coast was so subject to shipwreck as to have caused the insurance on ships to East London to be abnormally high. All these evils were acknowledged, but all these evils would assuredly be conquered by energy, skill, and money. It was thus that East London was spoken of by the friends who took me there in order that I might see the works which were being carried on with the view of overcoming nature. At the present moment East London is certainly a bad spot for shipping. A vessel had broken from her anchor just before my arrival and was lying on the shore a helpless wreck. There were the fragments to be seen of other wrecks, and I heard of many which had made the place noted within the last year or two. Such was the character of the place. I was told by more than one voice that vessels were sent there on purpose to be wrecked. Stories which I heard made me believe in Mr. Plimsoll more than I had ever believed before. She was intended to come on shore, was 
said by all voices that day in East London as to the vessel that was still lying among the breakers, while men were at work upon her to get out the cargo. They know that ships will drag their anchor here, so when they want to get rid of an old tub, they send her to East London. It was a terrible tale to hear, and especially so from men who themselves believe in the place with all the implicit confidence of expended capital. On the second day after my arrival the vessel that was to carry me on to Natal steamed into the roads. It had been a lovely morning and was yet early dash about eleven o'clock. I hurried down with a couple of friends to the man in authority who decides whether communication shall or shall not be had between the shore and the ship. And he, cocking a telescope to his eye, declared that even though the governor wanted to go on board he would not let a boat stir that day. In my ill humor I asked him why he would be more willing to risk the governor's life than that of any less precious individual. I own I thought he was a tyrant dash and perhaps a Sabbatarian, as it was on a Sunday. But in half an hour the wind had justified him, even to my uneducated intelligence. During the whole of that day there was no intercourse possible between the ships and the shore. A boat from a French vessel tried it, and three men out of four were drowned. Early on, the following day I was put on board the steamer in a lifeboat. Again, it was a lovely morning dash and the wind had altogether fallen dash but the boat shipped so much water that our luggage was wet through. But it is yet on the cards that the East Londoners may prevail. Under the auspices of Sir John Cuddy a breakwater is being constructed with the purpose of protecting the river's mouth from the prevailing winds. And the river is being banked and altered so that the increased force of the water through a narrowed channel may scour away the sand. If these two things can be done then ships will enter the Buffalo River and ride. They're in delicious ease, and the fortune of the place will be made. I went to see the works and was surprised to find operations of such magnitude going on at a place which apparently was so insignificant. A breakwater was being constructed out from the shore dash not an isolated seawall as is the breakwater at Plymouth and at Port Elizabeth dash but a pier projecting itself in a curve from one of the points of the river's mouth so as to cover the other when completed. On this 120,000 pounds had already been spent, and a further sum of 80,000 pounds is to be spent. It is to be hoped that it will be well expended dash for which the name of Sir John Cuddy is a strong guarantee. At present East London is not a nice place. It is without a pavement dash I may almost say without a street, dotted about over the right river bank. Here and there, dirty to look at and disheveled, putting one in mind of the American Eden as painted by Charles Dickens dash only that his Eden was a river Eden while this is a marine paradise. But all that no doubt will be mended when the breakwater has been completed. I have already spoken of the rivalry between South African ports, as between Port Alfred and Port Elizabeth, and between South African towns, as between Cape Town and Grahamstown. The feeling is carried everywhere, throughout everything. Opposite to the town of East London, on the left side of the Buffalo River, and connected with it by ferries, is the township of Panmore. The terminus of the railway is at Panmore and not at East London. And at Panmore there has gathered itself together an unpromising assemblage of stores and houses which declares of itself that it means to snuff East London altogether out. East London and Panmore together are strong. Against all the coast of South Africa to the right and left, but between the two places themselves there is as keen a rivalry as between any two towns on the continent. At East London I was assured that Panmore was merely upstart, dash but a Panmurite had his revenge by whispering to me that East London was a nest of mosquitoes. As to the mosquitoes I can speak from personal experience. And yet I ought to say a good word of East London for I was there but 
three days and was invited to three picnics. I went to two of them, and enjoyed myself thoroughly, seeing some beautiful scenery up the river and some charming spots along the coast. I was, however, very glad to get on board the steamer, having always had before my eyes the terrible prospect of a return journey to Port Elizabeth before I could embark for Natal. Chapter 12 Kaffir Schools The question of Kaffir education is perhaps the most important that has to be solved in South Africa dash and certainly it is the one as to which there exists the most violent difference of opinion among those who have lived in South Africa. A traveler in the land by associating exclusively with one set of persons would be taught to think that here was to be found a certain and quick panacea for all the ills and dangers to which the country is subjected. Here lies the way by which within an age or two the population of the country may be made to drop its savagery and kafirdom and blanket-loving vagabondism and become a people as fit to say their prayers and vote for members of parliament as at any rate the ordinary English Christian constituent. Let the kafir be caught young and subjected to religious education, and he will soon become so good a man and so docile a citizen that it will be almost a matter of regret that more of us were not born kafirs. That is the view of the question which prevails with those who have devoted themselves to Kafir education dash and of them it must be acknowledged that their efforts are continuous and energetic. I found it impossible not to be moved to enthusiasm by what I saw at Kafir schools. Another traveler falling into another and a different set will be told by his South African associates that the Kafir is a very good fellow and may be a very good servant till he has been taught to sing psalms and to take pride in his rapidly acquired book learning, dash but that then he becomes sly, a liar and a thief, whom it is impossible to trust and dangerous to have about the place. He is a Kafir still, a gentleman, said to me, but a Kafir with the addition of European cunning without a touch of European conscience. As far as I could observe, the merchants and shopkeepers who employ kafirs about their stores, and persons who have kafirs about their houses, do eschew the school kafir. They individual kafir when taken young and raw out of his blanket, put into breeches and subjected to the general dominion of a white master, is wonderfully honest, and, as far as he can speak at all, he speaks the truth. There can I think be no question about his virtues. You may leave your money about with perfect safety, though he knows well what money will do for him, you may leave food dash and even drink in his way and they will be safe. Is there any housebreaking or shoplifting? I asked a tradesman in King Williamstown. He declared that there was nothing of the kind known dash unless it might be occasionally in reference to a horse and saddle. A Kafir would sometimes be unable to resist the temptation of riding back into Kafirdom, the happy possessor of a steed. But let a lad have passed three or four years at a Kafir school, and then he would have become a being very much altered for the worse and not at all fit to be trusted among loose property. The saints in Kafir land will say that I have heard all this exclusively among the sinners. If so I can only say that the men of business are all sinners. For myself I found it very hard to form an opinion between the two, I do believe most firmly in education. I should cease to believe in anything. If I did not believe that education if continued will at least civilize, I can conceive no way of ultimately overcoming and dispelling what I must call the savagery of the Kafirs, but by education. And when I see the smiling, oily, good-humored, docile, naturally intelligent but still wholly uneducated black man trying to make himself useful and agreeable to his white employers, I still recognize the savage. With all his good humor and spasmodic efforts at industry he is no better than a savage. 
and the white man in many cases does not want him to be better. He is no more anxious that his Kafir should reason than he is that his horse should talk. It requires an effort of genuine philanthropy even to desire that those beneath us should become more nearly equal to us. The man who makes his money by employing Kafir labor is apt to regard the commercial rather than the philanthropic side of the question. I refuse, therefore, to adopt his view of the matter. A certain instinct of independence, which in the eyes of the employer of labor always takes the form of rebellion, is one of the first and finest effects of education. The Kafir who can argue a question of wages with his master has already become an objectionable animal. But again, the education of the educated Kafir is very apt to fall off. So much I have not only heard asserted generally by those who are and to Kafir educational in their sympathies, but admitted also by many of those who have been themselves long exercised in Kafir education. And in regard to religious teaching, we all know that the singing of psalms is easier than the keeping of the Ten Commandments. When we find much psalm singing and at the same time a very conspicuous breach of what has to us been a very sacred commandment, we are apt to regard the delinquent as a hypocrite. And the Kafir at school no doubt learns something of that doctrine dash which in his savage state was wholly unknown to him, but with which the white man is generally more or less conversant dash that speech has been given to men to enable them to conceal their thoughts. In learning to talk most of us learn to lie before we learn to speak the truth. While dropping something of his ignorance the savage drops something also of his simplicity. I can understand. Therefore why the employer of labor should prefer the unsophisticated Kafir, and am by no means sure that if I were looking out for black labor in order that I might make money out of it I should not eschew the Kafir from the schools. The difficulty arises probably from our impatience. Nothing will satisfy us unless we find a bath in which we may at once wash the blackamoor white, or a mill and oven in which a Kafir may be ground and baked instantly into a Christian. That much should be lost dash should fall off. As they say dash of the education imparted to them is natural. Among those of ourselves who have spent, perhaps, nine or ten years of our lives. Over Latin and Greek how much is lost. Perhaps I might say how little is kept. But something remains to us dash and something to them. There is need of very much patience. Those who expect that a Kafir boy, because he has been at school, should come forth the same as a white lad, all whose training since, and from long previous to his birth, has been a European training, will of course be disappointed. But we may, I think, be sure that no Kafir pupil can remain for years or even for months among European lessons and European habits, without carrying away with him to his own people, when he goes, something of a civilizing influence. My friend the Wesleyan minister, who by his eloquence prevailed over me, at Fort Beaufort in spite of my weariness and hunger, took me to Healed Town, the institution over which he himself presides. I had already seen Kaffir children and Kaffir lads under tuition at Cape Town. I had visited Miss Arthur's orphanage and school, where I had found a most interesting and cosmopolitan collection of all races, and had been taken by the Bishop of Cape Town to the Church of England Kaffir School at Zonebloom, and had there been satisfied of the great capability which the young Kaffir has for learning his lessons. I had been assured that up to a certain point and a certain age the Kaffir quite holds his own with the European. At Zonebloom a master carpenter was one of the instructors of the place, and, as I thought, by no means the least useful. The Kaffir lad may perhaps forget the names of the five great English poets with their dates and kings, by recapitulating which he has gained a prize at Lovedale Dash or may be unable some years after he 
has left the school to give an outline of Thompson's seasons, but when he has once learned how to make a table stand square upon four legs he has gained a power of helping his brother Kaffirs which will never altogether desert him. At Heald Town I found something less than fifty resident Kaffir boys and young men, six of whom were in training as students for the Wesleyan ministry. Thirteen Kaffir girls were being trained as teachers, and two hundred day scholars attended from the native huts in the neighborhood dash one of whom took her place on the school benches with her own little baby on her back. She did not seem to be in the least inconvenienced by the appendage. I was not lucky in my hours at Heald Town as I arrived late in the evening, and the tuition did not begin till half past nine in the morning, at which time I was obliged to leave the place. But I had three opportunities of hearing the whole Kaffir establishment sing their hymns. The singing of hymns is a thoroughly Kaffir accomplishment and the Kaffir words are soft and melodious. Hymns are very good, and the singing of hymns, if it be well done, is gratifying. But I remember feeling in the West Indies that they who devoted their lives to the instruction of the young Negroes thought too much of this pleasant and easy religious exercise, and were hardly enough alive to the expediency of connecting conduct with religion. They black singers of Heald Town were, I was assured, a very moral and orderly set of people, and if so the hymns will not do them any harm. For the erudition of such of my readers as have not hitherto made themselves acquainted with the religious literature of Kaffir land I hear give the words of a hymn which I think to be peculiarly mellifluous in its sounds. I will not annex a translation, as I cannot myself venture upon versifying it, and a prose version would sound bald and almost irreverent. I will merely say that it is in praise of the Redeemer, which name is signified by the oft-repeated word um koliali. If the lover of sweet sounds will read the lines aloud, merely adding a half-pronounced you at the beginning of those words which are commenced with an otherwise unpronounceable ng, so as to make a semi elided syllable, I think he will understand the nature of the sweetness of sound which Kaffirs produce in their singing. When he finds that nearly all the lines and more than half the words begin with the same letter he will of course be aware that their singing is monotonous. I was glad to find that the Kaffir scholars at Heald Town among them paid £200 per annum towards the expense of the institution. The government grants £700, and the other moiety of the total cost which amounts to pound 800 dash is defrayed by the Wesleyan missionary establishment at home. As the Kaffir contribution is altogether voluntary, such payment shoes and anxiety on the part of the parents that their children should be educated. As far as I remember nothing was done at Heald Town to teach the children any trade. It is altogether a Wesleyan missionary establishment, combining a general school in which religious education is perhaps kept uppermost, with a training college for native teachers and ministers. I cannot doubt but that its effect is salutary. It has been built on a sweet healthy spot up among the hills, and nothing is more certain than the sincerity and true philanthropy of those who are engaged upon its work. My friend who had carried me off from Fort Beaufort kept his word like a true man the next morning, in allowing me to start at the time named, and himself drove me over a high mountain to Lovedale. How we ever got up and down those hillsides with a pair of horses and a vehicle, I cannot even yet imagine, dash but it was done. There was a way round, but the minister seemed to think that a straight line to any place or any object must be the best way, and over the mountain we went. Some other Wesleyan minister before his days, he said, had done it constantly and had never thought anything about it. The horses did go up and did go down, which was only additional evidence to me that things of this kind are done in the colonies which would not be attempted in England. 
On my going down the hill towards Lovedale, when we had got well out of the Heald Town District, an argument arose between me and my companion as to the general effect of education on Kafir life. He was of opinion that the Kafirs in that locality were really educated, whereas I was quite willing to elicit from him the sparks of his enthusiasm by suggesting that all their learning faded as soon as they left school. Drive up to that hut, I said, picking out the best looking in the village, and let us see whether there be pens, ink and paper in it. It was hardly a fair test, because such accommodation would not be found in the cottage of many educated Englishmen. But again, on the other side, in my desire to be fair I had selected something better than a normal hut. We got out of our vehicle, undid the latch of the door dash which was something halfway between a Christian doorway and the ordinary low hole through which the ordinary Kafir creeps in and out dash and found the habitation without its owners. But an old woman in the crawl had seen us, and had hurried across to exercise hospitality on behalf of her absent neighbors. Our desire was explained to her and she at once found pens and ink. With the pens and ink there was probably paper, on which she was unable to lay her hand. I took up, however, an old ragged quarto edition of St. Paul's epistles dash with very long notes. The test as far as it was carried certainly supported my friend's view. Lovedale is a place which has had and is having very great success. It has been established under Presbyterian auspices but is in truth altogether undenominational in the tuition which it gives. I do not say that religion is neglected, but religious teaching does not strike the visitors as the one great object of the institution. The schools are conducted very much like English schools dash with this exception, that no classes are held after the one o'clock dinner. The Kafir mind has by that time received as much as it can digest. There are various masters for the different classes, some classical, some mathematical, and some devoted to English literature. When I was there there were eight teachers, independent of Mr. Buchanan who was the acting head or president of the whole institution. Dr. Stewart, who is the permanent head, was absent in Central Africa. At Lovedale, both with the boys and girls black and white are mixed when in school without any respect of color. At one o'clock I dined in hall with the establishment, and then the colored boys sat below the Europeans. This is justified on the plea that the Europeans pay more than the Kafirs and are entitled to a more generous fare dash which is true. The European boys would not come were they called upon to eat the coarser food which suffices for the Kafirs. But in truth neither would the Europeans frequent the schools if they were required to eat at the same table with the natives. That feeling is to eating and drinking is the same in British Kafraria as it was with Shylock in Venice. The European domestic servant will always refuse to eat with the Kafir servant. Sitting at the high table dash that is the table with the bigger of the European boys, I had a very good dinner. At Lovedale there are altogether nearly 400 scholars, of whom about 70 are European. Of this number about 300 live on the premises and are what we call boarders. The others are European day scholars from the adjacent town of Alice who have gradually joined the establishment because the education is much better than anything else that can be had in the neighborhood. There are among the boarders 30 European boys. They European girls were all day scholars from the neighborhood. They colored boarders pay six pounds per annum, for which everything is supplied to them in the way of food and education. The lads are expected to supply themselves with mattresses, pillows, sheets, and towels. I was taken through the dormitories, and the beds are neat enough with their rug coverings. 
I did not like to search further by displacing them. They. White boarders pay 40 pounds per annum. The Kaffir Day Scholars pay but 30 s. And the European Day Scholars 60s. Per annum. In this way 2,650 pounds is. Collected. Added to this is an allowance of 2,000 pounds per annum from the. Government. These two sources comprise the certain income of the school. But the institution owns and farms a large tract of land. It has 3,000 acres, of which 400 are cultivated, and the remainder stocked with sheep. Lovedale at present owns a flock numbering 2,000. The native lads are called upon to work two hours each afternoon. They cut dams and make roads, and take care of the garden. Added to the school are workshops in which young Kaffirs are apprenticed. The carpenter's department is by far the most popular, and certainly the most useful. Here they make much of the furniture used upon the place, and repair the breakages. They wagon makers come next to the carpenters in number, and then, at a long interval, the blacksmiths. Two other trades are also represented dash printing namely, and book binding. There were in all 27 Carpenters with four furniture makers, sixteen wagon makers, eight blacksmiths, five printers, and two bookbinders, dash all of whom seem to be making efficient way in their trades. This direction of practical work seems to be the best which such an institution can take. I asked what became of these apprentices and was told that many among them established themselves in their own country as master tradesmen in a small way, and could make a good living among their Kaffir neighbors. But I was told also that they could not often find employment in the workshops of the country unless the employers used nothing but Kaffir labor. The white man will not work along with the Kaffir on equal terms. When he is placed with Kaffirs he expects to be boss, or master, and gradually learns to think that it is his duty to look on and superintend, while it is the Kaffir's duty to work under his dictation. The white bricklayer may continue to lay his bricks while they are carried for him by a black hodsman, but he will not lay a brick at one end of the wall while a Kaffir is laying an equal brick at the other. But in this matter of trades the skill when once acquired will of course make itself available to the general comfort and improvement of the Kaffir world around. I was at first inclined to doubt the wisdom of the printing and book binding, as being premature, but the numbers engaged in. These exceptional trades are not greater perhaps than Lovedale itself. Can use. I do not imagine that a Kaffir printing press will for many years be set up by Kaffir Capital and conducted by Kaffir Enterprise. It will come probably, but the Kaffir tables and chairs and the Kaffir wagons should come first. At present there is a Lovedale News, published about twice a month. It is issued, says the Lovedale printed report, for circulation at Lovedale and chiefly about Lovedale matters. The design of this publication was to create a taste for reading among the native pupils. It has been carried on through twelve numbers, says the report, with a fair prospect of success and rather more than a fair share of difficulties. The difficulties I can well imagine, which generally amount to this in the establishment of a newspaper dash that the ambitious attempt so often costs more than it produces. Mr. Thiel is one of the masters of Lovedale, and his history of South Africa was here. Printed, dash but not perhaps with so good a pecuniary result as if it had been printed elsewhere. I was told by the European foreman in the printing establishment that the Kaffirs learned the art of composition very readily, but that they could not be got to pull off the sheets fairly and straightly. As to the book binding, I am in possession of one specimen which is fair enough. The work is in two volumes and it was given to me at Cape Town, 
dash but unfortunately the two volumes are of different colors. In the younger classes among the scholars the Kafirs were very efficient. None of them, I think, had reached the dignity of Greek or natural philosophy, but some few had ascended to algebra and geometry. When I asked what became of all this in after life there was a doubt. Even at Lovedale it was acknowledged that after a time it fell off, dash or in other words that much that was taught was afterwards lost. Out in the world, as I have said before, among the Europeans who regard the Kafir simply as a savage to whom Pigeon English has to be talked, it is asserted broadly that all this education leads to no good. Results dash that the Kafir who has sung hymns and learned to do sums is a savage to whose natural and native savagery additional iniquities have been added by the ingenuity of the white philanthropist. To this opinion, I will not accede. That such a place as Lovedale should do evil rather than good is to my thinking impossible. To see a lot of Kafir lads and lasses at school is of course more interesting than to inspect a seminary of white pupils. It is something as though one should visit a lion tamer with a group of young lions around him. The Kafir has been regarded at home as a bitter and almost terrible enemy who, since we first became acquainted with him in South Africa, has worked us infinite woe. I remember when a Kafir was regarded as a dusky demon and there was a doubt whether he could ever be got under and made subject to British rule, dash whether in fact he would not in the long run be too much for the Britons. The Kafir warrior with his Asagai and his red clay, and his courageous hatred, was a terrible fellow to see. And he is still much more of a savage than the ordinary Negro to whom we have become accustomed in other parts of the world. It was very interesting to see him with a slate and pencil, wearing his coarse clothing with a jaunty happy air, and doing a sum in subtraction. I do not know whether an appearance of good humor and self-satisfaction combined does not strike the European more than any other Kafir. Characteristic He never seems to assert that he is as good as a white man dash as the usual Negro will do whenever the opportunity is given to him dash but that though he be inferior there is no reason why he should not be as jolly as circumstances will admit. The Kafir girl is the same. When seen in the schools, her aspect no doubt will be much altered for the worse when she follows the steps of her Kafir husband as his wife and slave. But at Lovedale she is comparatively smart and gay-looking. Many of these pupils while still at school reach the age at which young people fall in love with each other. I was told that the young men and young women were kept strictly apart, but nevertheless, marriages between them on their leaving school are not uncommon dash nor unpopular with the authorities. It is probable that a young man who has been some years at Lovedale will treat his wife with something of Christian forbearance. I find from the printed report of the seminary that the four following young ladies got the prizes in 1877 at Lovedale for the different virtues appended to their names. I insert the short list here not only that due honor may be given to the ladies themselves, but also that my readers may see something of Kafir female nomenclature. Girls. General prizes. Underscore Bible. Dot underscore underscore good conduct underscore. Victoria Quanque. Entame Magazine. Underscore tidiness in dress underscore underscore for best kept room underscore. Entomenthal Angiclina. Sarah Ann Bobby. Sarah Ann Bobby. Miss Quanque and Miss Bobby had I suppose Christian names given to them. Early in life. The other two are in possession of thoroughly Kafir. Appellations dash especially the young lady who has excelled in tidiness. And who no doubt will have become a bride before these lines are read in. England. I was taken out from King William's town to Peel Town to see another. Educational Kafir Establishment At Peel Town the Reverend Mr. Bird presides over a large Kafir congregation, and has an excellent church capable of 
holding 500, which has been built almost exclusively by Kafir. Contributions The boys' school was empty, but I was taken to see the girls who lived together under the charge of an English lady. I wished that I might have been introduced to the presence of the girls at once, so as to find how they occupied themselves when not in school. But this was not to be. I was kept waiting for a few moments, and then was ushered into a room where I found about twenty of them sitting in a row. Hemming linen. They were silent, well-behaved and very demure while I saw them dash and then before I left they sang a hymn. If I had an institution of my own to exhibit I feel sure that I should want to put my best foot forward dash and the best foot among Kafir female. Pupils is perhaps the singing of hymns and the hemming of linen.